If you want me to continue with my work, it is crucial to support the channel via Patreon. Moreover, make sure to subscribe to Bobby's Perspective on Rumble. All the links are in the description box below. May Allah bless you all. Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, absolutely fascinating video today. We're gonna see the first Christian critique of Islam by a man called John of Damascus or how Christians call him, of course, Saint John of Damascus. John of Damascus was an Arabic-speaking man. His real name was Yuhana ibn Mansur ibn Sarjun. He was an Arab Christian monk, a priest, a hymnographer, and of course an apologist. He was born and raised in Damascus around 675 or 676. It was around 720 when he finalized his work The Fountain of Knowledge. It entails philosophical chapters concerning heresy and exact exposition of the Orthodox faith. And within this work, quote-unquote, Saint John of Damascus, critiques Islam for the very first time. So this should be an absolutely amazing read because we see one of the earliest church fathers roughly 100 years after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam attacking Islam. He's one of the OGs of the enemies of Islam. I'm super excited for today's video, guys. If you enjoy my work, leave me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check out the links in the description box to further support. And now, with no further ado, let's have a look. All right, we are on the Orthodox Christian Information Center homepage, and here we can read Saint John of Damascus critique of Islam. He writes, there is also the superstition of the Ishmaelites, which to this day prevails and keeps people in error, being a forerunner of the Antichrist. So this is of course very interesting because nowadays we have Christian apologists, we have Christian evangelicals, and they always claim that Islam is the Antichrist religion, etc. So here you can find that it has its roots in Saint John's of Damascus writings. But what I personally find very interesting here is that Saint John acknowledges that the Muslims are Ishmaelites, Ismailites, descendants from Ismail and hence descendants from Prophet Abraham. He proceeds, they are descendant from Ishmael, who was born to Abraham of Agar. And for this reason, they are called both Agarines and Ishmaelites. They are also called Saracens, which is derived from Saras Kenoi or destitute of Sarah, because of what Agar said to the angel. Sarah hath sent me away destitute. So as already mentioned here, John of Damascus fully acknowledges the prophetic lineage of the Muslims, being descendants of Abraham himself. Here he writes, these used to be idolaters and worshipped the morning star and Aphrodite, whom in their own language they called Habar, which means great. And so down to the time of Heraclius, they were very great idolaters. From that time to the present, a false prophet named Muhammad has appeared in their midst. And here you see how extremely irrational the claim already was back then. Just a few years after the prophet, may peace be upon him, this man John of Damascus, one of the early Christians, one of the early Arabic-speaking Christians, already calls out and says, Prophet Muhammad is a false prophet, he is not a real prophet. And this is what echoes into this day and age. Even nowadays, of course, we hear the same rhetoric over and over again. He is a false prophet. But... It is extremely irrational. Why? Because the man here himself just described that the Muslims back in the day used to be idolaters and now they're not anymore. Now they're pure monotheists. So if Prophet Muhammad brought the message and turned the idolaters into monotheists, how can you then make the claim that he is a false prophet? Absolute nonsense. Muhammad has appeared in their midst. This man, after having chanced upon Upon the Old and New Testaments, and likewise, it seems, <laughs> having conversed with an Aryan monk, devised his own heresy. So this is really why I want to share the writings of John of Damascus with you guys, because those arguments that are presented now by Christians are nothing new. From the get-go, once Islam started, you already had enemies of Islam. They were already in opposition, giving you absolutely false, irrational arguments 
arguments like this here. He conversed with an Aryan monk. That is a conspiracy that you probably heard quite often online. Why? Because it was John of Damascus that was writing about it. However, with no proof whatsoever. Because mind you, John of Damascus comes 100 years after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He has no proof whatsoever. He just makes this up. Yo, well, this sounds a bit like Arianism. And for people that don't know about Arianism, it was declared a heresy within Christianity because the followers of Arius did not believe that Jesus was God. They still believe that he is a son of God and some certain metaphysical attributions to him. But nevertheless, they did not prescribe to a trinity. And because this pure monotheism looks similar to Arianism, which looks in turn similar to monotheism, oh well, it must have been a Christian monk. Oh well, this is of course another heresy that has been copied. This claim has been debunked a billion times over and over again because if Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, would have copied Christianity, then he would have copied the mistakes found within the Bible as well. We do not have those mistakes that we can find within the Bible. And moreover, if he truly wanted to copy Christianity, he would have copied the Greek mythological and philosophical claims such as the Trinity. Why would he call to pure monotheism if he copied Christianity? It doesn't add up one way or the other. But the point of the story is, just talking about this, I realize people are so far removed of Tawhid. They're so far removed from their own fitra, they really do not understand what pure monotheism is. Even if it stares them right in their face when they're reading the Old Testament and they find those glimpses of pure monotheism when Abraham is submitting his will to that one God or where Jesus speaks about worshipping one God alone, they don't even see that anymore. And all they see is, oh, well, Trinity must be the truth because the church fathers told me so and therefore anything that removes the Trinity must be a heresy and therefore a false prophet. Why do you make it so complicated, man? The Ishmaelites, this is how you call them, used to be idolaters. They let go of their idolatry and returned to the worship of one God. This is exactly the same thing that Moses called his people to do. People were worshipping golden calves and what not. People would always be called back to the pure monotheistic worship of one God. If you believe that that is a heresy, Congratulations, you've been brainwashed. Then, having insinuated himself into the good graces of the people by a show of seeming piety, he gave out that a certain book had been sent down to him from heaven. He had set down some ridiculous compositions in this book of his and he gave it to them as an object of veneration. And honestly, those are the great scholars that Christians refer you to. Or oh, read St. John of Damascus about heresy, such a masterful work. It is absolutely ridiculous, of course, man. Look what this guy is writing. First and foremost, we know that the Prophet wasallam went into the cave. This is where he received revelation. Once that revelation was heard by the Arabs during that time, and mind you, they were heavily interested in poetry. Poetry in Arabia was extremely sophisticated already, but none of them have ever heard anything like the Quran. This is why the Quran attracted people. It was not because the Prophet just handed out that book and told them, hey, venerate this book now. Ha! Oh, such a ridiculous ridiculous book. Look how unsophisticated those claims are. Don't you see this? Those are writings of an absolute idiot, man. When people heard the Quran, they started weeping. They couldn't contain their emotions because they never heard anything so beautiful in their life. And the challenge stands to this very day. The Quran tells us, produce something like it if you can. But people are not able to produce anything of such eloquence. It's absolutely comical that this John of Damascus doesn't give us any proof. He's one of the original original trolls here before the invention of the internet. He does not say, go read the Quran yourself, compare it to the Bible, see what it says. No, no, no. He says right away, no, it's so ridiculous. Haha, <laughs> don't even read it. He proceeds, he says that there is one God, creator of all things who has neither been begotten nor has begotten. Exactly. He says that the Christ is the word of God and his spirit but a creature and a servant, and that he was begotten, without seed, 
of Mary, the sister of Moses and Aaron. For he says, the word and God and the spirit entered into Mary and she brought forth Jesus, who was a prophet and servant of God. And he says that the Jews wanted to crucify him in violation of the law and that they seized his shadow and crucified this. But the Christ himself was not crucified, he says, nor did he die, for God, out of his love for him, took him to himself into heaven. And he says this, that when the Christ had ascended into heaven, God asked him, O oh Jesus, didst thou say, I am the Son of God and God? And Jesus, he says, Be merciful to me, Lord, thou knowest that I did not say this, and that I did not scorn to be thy servant. But sinful men have written that I made this statement, and they have lied about me, and have fallen into error. And God answered and said to him, I know that thou didst not say this word. This is truly amazing yet again, because I have to repeat myself to this very day, those arguments are being brought forth over and over again, being debunked, and then they bring them forth yet again, starting with this John of Damascus. It's absolutely hilarious. So the point of the story is, he finds, ah, Jesus is the word. See, we were right. He is the Logos. And then for the billionth time, the Muslims give you the explanation. Word of God in this context simply means that Jesus is an exalted messenger of God that brings you the message of God. He received the Injil, we believe, the original gospel. So this is the word of God. God that he brought forth to his people. He brings the word of God into this world, hence the honorific title, if you will, Word of God. But I know this is too complex and too complicated for Christians because Christians, when they read in the Bible, Son of God, they believe he is the literal Son of God. He continues, there are many other extraordinary and quite ridiculous things in this book, which he boasts was sent down to him from God. But when we ask, and who is there to testify that God gave him the book, and which of the prophets foretold that such a prophet would rise up, they are at a loss. And we remark that Moses received the law on Mount Sinai, with God appearing in the sight of all the people in the cloud, and fire and darkness and storm. And we say that all the prophets from Moses on down foretold the coming of Christ, and how Christ God and incarnate Son of God was to come and to be crucified and die and rise again, and how he was to be the judge of the living and the dead. Then when we say, how is it that this prophet of yours did not come in the same way with others bearing witness to him? And how is it that God did not in your presence present this man with the book to which you refer, even as he gave the law to Moses, with the people looking on and the mountain smoking, so that you too might have certainty? They answer that God does as he pleases. This, we say, we know, but we are asking how the book came down to your prophet. Then they reply that the book came down to him while he was asleep. Then we jokingly say to them that as long as he received the book in his sleep and did not actually sense the operation, then the popular adage applies to him, which runs, you're spinning me dreams. So this classical Christian cherry picking at its finest, of course, they take Moses and allegedly somehow the people saw how he received the scripture, which is not true whatsoever. He receives the scripture at Mount Sinai and then comes down. So nobody is there with him witnessing that act. He simply comes down with the stone tablets. This is what the people see. But be that as it may, even if we would say, hey, here the people saw it, they saw him coming down, fine. How about Noah? How about Abraham? How about all of those other prophets? Did anybody see what they received as revelation? No, they were in touch with God. They were in contact with God. The other people couldn't see it. So those people came as prophets, as warners to warn their nations. There's a common narrative within the Old Testament, but this is of course willing fully ignored here by Saint John. Let's continue. This is a funny part. Moreover, they call us heterists or associators because they say we introduce and associate with God by declaring Christ to the Son of God and God. We say to them in rejoinder, the prophets and the scriptures have delivered this to us and you, as you persistently maintain, except the prophets. So if we wrongly declare Christ to be the Son of God, 
It is they who taught this and handed it on to us. Yeah, exactly. And the Quran says that your ancestors were not guided either. So you simply take their word for it and say, hey guys, well, this is what has been handed over to us and therefore it must be true. This is absolutely ridiculous. Listen to the statement that is being made. You are associators per definition because you're not praying to God alone. You call him the Father sometimes. Okay, if you would just pray to the Father, so be it. No, you're praying to the Father, you're praying to the Son, you're praying to the Holy Spirit, you're praying to Mother Mary, and you're praying to saints. And nowadays, some people, this is really true, pray to this man, Saint John of Damascus. He is a saint, so please intercede for me. Saint John, listen to my prayers and deliver them to God. God is very busy. He cannot listen to my prayer. Please, Saint John, deliver my prayer to him. This intercession, this association, and therefore, yes, you are associators. But some of them say that it is by misinterpretation that we have represented the prophets as saying such things, while others say that the Hebrews hated us and deceived us by writing in the name of the prophets so that we might be lost. Yeah, speaking about the Hebrews that potentially deceived them, sure could be, because Saint Paul, originally named Saulus, was a Jew, of course, that came with a different message. And therefore, yes, it is absolutely justified to assume that you've been deceived. And again, we say to them, as long as you say that Christ is the word of God, yeah, yet again, and spirit, why do you accuse us of being heterious? For the word and the spirit is inseparable from that in which it naturally has existence. Therefore, if the word of God is in God, then it is obvious that he is God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. If, however, he is outside of God, then according to you, God is without word and without spirit. Consequently, by avoiding the introduction of an associate with God, you have mutilated him. It would be far better for you to say that he has an associate than to mutilate him, as if you were dealing with a stone or a piece of wood or some other inanimate object. Thus, you speak untruly when you call us heterius. We retort by calling you mutilators of God. Yeah, again, building a fantastic straw man here. Really, now reading this ancient text here, you understand why Christians argue the way that they argue. This is truly a spiritual battle between Muslims and Christians, between falsehood and truth, of course. And to this very day, they're just regurgitating the same damn lies over and over again. Yet again. Nobody says that God has no word, that he is a rock, a stone, as this man claims here. No, of course not. We believe that the Quran is the revealed word of God as well. Sure. However, when we're speaking about Jesus, we're speaking about an honorific title. Please do not take everything literal. I believe you can put one and one together. Actually, I'm wrong. You can't. One plus one plus one equals one. I forgot. Nobody is mutilating God as if that was possible in the first place. We simply say that Jesus brought the message of God, hence, as the Messiah, he has the honorific title of Word of God. I know, it's really hard to understand. They furthermore accuse us of being idolatrous because we venerate the cross, which they abominate. And we answer them, how is it then that you rub yourself against the stone in your Kaaba and kiss and embrace it? Then some of them say that Abraham had relations with Agur upon it. What? But others say that he tied the camel to it. What? Okay, wow, they've been really liars from the get-go. That's quite shocking, to be totally honest. The point of the story is we as Muslims know, of course, that the Kaaba itself is not an object of worship, anything on those sorts. But from Hadith, we know that Prophet Muhammad apparently kissed that stone. However, it is not to benefit us or to venerate that stone. It is more about emulating the way of the Prophet, aka the Sunnah. We try to mimic and copy what the Prophet has done. But yet again, this is not an object of veneration henceforth. It is an object of direction if you're speaking about the Kaaba. That's all. Now he proceeds with his lies and he says, as has been related, this Muhammad wrote many ridiculous books. <laughs> yeah, sure, even though we know that he was illiterate and couldn't write, but he wrote many ridiculous books. To each one of which he set a title. Aha, here, here. For example, there is the book on women. 
in which he plainly makes legal provisions for taking four wives and, if it be possible, a thousand concubines, as many as one can maintain besides the four wives. All right, first and foremost, there is no such book, go figure. However, that being said, the four wives is already a reduction. Yeah, believe it or not, because in pre-Islamic Arabia, you could take as many wives as you wanted. So the four wives is a limitation. During the time, people lamented, oh, why only four wives, right? But the Christians here, they're lamenting, oh, why so many wives, right? This is just subjective. Yet again, it has nothing to do with objective revelation from God. In Islam, we can have four wives. That's that. You can be bitter and sour about it as much as you want to. But that being said about the concubines, even if it were true that you can take unlimited concubines, Fine. How about King Solomon? Is he not a prophet within Christianity? Of course he is. And that prophet had 300 concubines. But that's of course not enough, because he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, which adds up to a thousand women around him. So now if Solomon was a prophet of God, which the Christian would agree with, of course, and he had thousand women around him, of which 700 were his wives, what is exactly your problem with having four wives and concubines? It's always this hypocritical double standard, man. Doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Christians stayed the same for the past thousand something years. He proceeds with his lies shamelessly. Then there is the book, The Camel of God. About this camel, he says that there was a camel from God and that she drank the whole river and could not pass through two mountains because there was not room enough. There were people in that place, he says, and they used to drink the water on one day, while the camel would drink it on the next. Ah, okay, now I get it. So what he is describing here is the story of the prophet Saleh. And this is something that we can find within the Quran and not in a book called The Camel of God. Ridiculous. Saleh was sent as a prophet to the Tamud people, who were known for their wealth and arrogance. One of the miracles associated with Prophet Saleh was the miraculous she-camel that emerged from a rock. So I did the Prophet stories and if you've been following this channel then you saw this story as well. This is found within the Quran, but this shameless Christian that is dead now anyways claimed of course that, oh, there's a separate book, The Camel of God. Alright, this is it for today's video. I'm going to cut it off here. However, I'm going to link the whole text in the description box so you can read it in its entirety and decide for yourself if this is good criticism or not. For me, it is quite amazing to see that Christians over the past millennia have not improved their arguments. They resort to the same tactics of lying and slandering, making things up. <laughs> the book of the camel of God, the book of the woman. Yeah, yeah, sure, man. Nice try. Ultimately, guidance is up to Allah and therefore we can say Alhamdulillah love for Islam. Alhamdulillah, we are Muslim and we are happy and satisfied with our faith, of course. Thank God, man, we don't have to associate partners to our God in order to live our life. Quite the opposite, our life is free of confusion because we believe in one God alone. Alhamdulillah, yet again. Therefore, I want to end this video with some words from the Quran. The truth has come and falsehood has vanished. Indeed, falsehood is bound to vanish. Many, many religions have vanished over the millennia. Religions with thousands of years of tradition. But falsehood is bound to vanish. This is just what it is. Look at Zoroastrianism, for example. It vanished, even though it had a rich, long tradition. Falsehood will vanish because it simply cannot stand the test of time. Therefore, you see in this video, this is absolutely nothing new. People always try to fit God into their own mental constructs. They try to attribute something to God. But all of that is false. God is one, only one. Return to the worship of one God alone. I hereby invite you to Islam. All right, guys, and this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check out the links in the description box below to further support. And as always, guys, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.